Thank you, Hannah, for joining us again today after Sunday. We continue to talk about the education experience and whether it's a fair playing field for this generation and what we can do to, to move it forward. You are Hannah and you're the Director of Diverse Educators, is that correct? Correct. Do you want to tell us a little bit about Diverse Educators before we jump into the interview? Yeah, I think it's important to give a bit of context. So um, I'm Hannah Wilson, I'm an ex-head teacher, so I spent 18 years as a teacher in the system. Um, and I think through the, that 18 years within my career, I've done lots of work supporting different teachers and leaders, and I do quite a lot of leadership development. Um, but there's been a lack of diversity in the circles I sit in. So when I was a middle leader, I was the only woman and everyone was white. When I was an assistant head, I was the only woman, everyone was white. When I was a deputy head, I was the only woman, everyone was white. There's a bit of a pattern here emerging. <laughs> I, as a woman, didn't have a lot of visible role models around me. So five years ago, I was one of the co-founders of Women Ed. And Women Ed is a grassroots community for women in education um, who are aspiring or existing leaders. And it's about mm. creating that network of support around you and finding those visible role models. Women Ed kind of like took the lid off and off the back of Women Ed, a year later, BAME Ed launched. A okay. year later, LGBT Ed launched and a year later, Disability Ed launched. So we've uh -huh. now got four thriving grassroots communities that are looking after different people with different protective characteristics where people um, support, nurture, empower, mentor, coach, but also mm. do the allyship. However, if you are someone with more than one protective characteristic, uh -huh. you have to then decide which event you go to and like almost like compartmentalize yourself. Yeah. And when I was ahead, my deputy head, Benny, came to me one day and she said, like, Han, it's ridiculous. I can't go to four Saturday conferences. And I was like, well, don't go then. And she said, but I need to go. I'm a woman. I'm a brown woman. I'm a brown woman who's bisexual and I'm a brown woman <laughs> who's bisexual with, with a hearing aid. Can't we do one uh -huh. event that brings it all together? So Diverse uh -huh. Educators started off three years ago as an event once a year to look at intersectionality in education so that okay. you're not leading with one part of your identity, but you're thinking about your whole self. Okay. And, it, and it basically joins up the dots. Off the back of this annual event, um, we are building a website at the moment because I think okay. with, the, with the spotlight on diversity, equity and inclusion in education, mm. everyone now knows they need to do it. A lot of us have known we've needed to do it for a long time. But if yeah. you're not on social media, you're not leaning in these spaces, you're not connecting these spaces, it's quite overwhelming, I think, to A, know what yeah. to do, or B, know how to do it, or C, know who's got the credentials and the credibility to do this mm. work. So I've basically gone out, I was going to do it for January because I've only gone independent since May, but because of what's been happening in the world, in the sector, in the system in the last few months, we've brought that forward and I've basically got um, partners who are sponsoring the website yeah. and the website is going to drop on September the 1st and it's going to signpost out all the activity in okay. all the different protected characteristics. So if okay. you are that straight, white, able-bodied, female, primary school head teacher in Wiltshire, you're not on Twitter and you don't mm. know where to start, you can go mm. to the website and it will signpost you out. And okay. our event back in June that should have been face-to-face -face went virtual and we had 13 and a half thousand people join wow. us at the event, wow. which yeah. I think says that the time's right right now for yeah. schools yeah. to really lean into the, the, the work that we know needs to be done, the system yeah. needs to be disrupted, it needs to be dismantled. Um, and I think race is obviously the most prominent protected characteristic at the moment, but there's also work to be done in some of the other areas as well. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. And, and, and we look forward to seeing the website actually, so, so, so good on that. Um, obviously, when we were talking on Sunday, a lot of our conversation was to do with the challenges um, around the BAME community or the Black community within the education space. And the good thing was that following our session on Sunday, there was also the BBC interview on Monday that sort of picked up the issue as well and talked about the, the issue Black teachers face, you know, and, and talk about barriers such as discrimination and, and gaining promotion. And as a result, obviously, there, there are a lot of challenges for, for the Black community when it comes to, to education and there's underrepresentation. And one of the stats I remember hearing on BBC News is that currently there are just over 1% of senior leaders within school that are black and that black teachers are more than three times more likely than their white colleagues to face formal action. So you, you look at all of this information and you look at the landscape we have now. 
and you can see that it's not a fair landscape. Now, what I want to ask you first to kick us off is having had all this conversation on Sunday um, and with all the pulsing and, and the chats going really uh, sort of doing their own thing, on reflection, are there a few things that you really want to speak into that perhaps you didn't get the opportunity to? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's also about breaking it down. I think it's thinking about the different, the different barriers and obstacles. And if we think mm. about the kind of the journey of aspiring to be a teacher, to being a head teacher, it's quite, it's quite a long yeah. journey. So I think if we think about stage one, first of all, we need to think about the kind of the attraction into education and and mm. is education, is teaching a career that people of colour aspire to? Because I think yeah. there's sometimes a misnarrative here that it's, look, I, I know in education as a leader, I've got told quite a lot that like, if you're Asian, you're, you're more likely to want to be a doctor, a vet, a dentist, because mm. it's a cultural thing. And actually, is there, is there a piece there around careers education rhetoric about which, which cultures, which genders, which races are aspiring to which, which um, mm. career? But equally, is there a limiting self-belief factor there as well? Because I think mm. somebody spoke in the chat about perhaps BAME people, and I'm sorry about label, what, what label should we use? Black people, brown people, people of colour? Like yeah, just, just, just say black people, okay. that's fine. So, so um, it's not that, is, is it that black people don't want to train to teach because they had a poor experience in school themselves as a, as a student? And, and actually, does it then become a cycle of, if BAME children, if black children in schools are having a poor experience in the school system why do they want to go and teach and yeah. I, so I think there's, there's something there to address and then some data that's come to light recently is that there's a narrative that actually um, black people aren't applying to teach that's not true they are mm. applying to teach there's a disproportionate number of of offers being made to white men versus black men or 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 white women versus white um, black women so actually it's not that people aren't applying it's that there's some sort of systemic barrier right at the entry into education where um, people of color aren't being offered even the mm -hmm. option to come and train to teach if we fast forward by three to five years i think i share the data but i'll reiterate yeah. it that we've got shocking attrition data it's, it's embarrassing as a sector that a third of our trainee teachers leave at the end of the third year and mm. half leave by the end of the fifth year but if you break down that data and you distill it down to protect characteristics you've got a dis disproportionate number of women leaving mm. and you've also got people with different different protected characteristics who become vulnerable in the system mm. so you might get through that door as a black man or a black woman trained to teach but you might only last three years or five years yeah and you might only last three or five years for a couple of reasons because you you're traumatized and you're through the prejudice and discrimination that you experience or you're put on competency and capability or you're sidelined for opportunities that your mm. your peers are getting and you're not talent spotted and you're not nurtured and i think then there's quite a few things to unpack there in that kind of year one to year five if you get to your fifth year, then you should be then moving into middle leadership. But you then, quite often I hear you then get um, stereotyped or segmented into, if you're a black man, you do behaviour. Well, what if you're a black man who wants to do curriculum or wants to do yeah. teaching and learning or wants to do something else? So I, I've heard from um, the black men who do the programmes I run around like diverse leadership that they leave the sector because they don't want to get pigeonholed. And they mm. don't want to be the black man who's the head of the year. And the, mm. there, there are men of, of colour who do those roles because it's a role they want to do. But it needs to be what career pathway do I want rather yeah. than being pigeonholed. And then getting beyond middle leadership in education, like to get into to senior leadership is, is really hard. Um, and as I said, I've worked on several senior leadership teams, which are all white. Um, like you are the only, like you are, you are the only person of colour who, who gets into those spaces and those spaces are very white and they're very patriarchal. So actually, it, like, it's all well and good, the system saying we need more diversity, but are we actually going to change the cultures in our schools and in the system and make our workplaces more inclusive that mm. if we do recruit and we do um, retain, is it then a safe and a secure place for people to be? So that's just some of the issues that I'm kind of very aware of. Yeah, and I think those are good things because I, I then, obviously the follow-on question for me from that is, so where is the bottleneck? Who, who is stopping, you know, who is stopping 
black people, people, you know, from minority communities from getting through and, and what is being protected by not allowing them to get through because that then affects, like you said, you know, the, the whole population that's been educated, you know, and, and why would I go into teaching if I, if I know that I can't see people who look like me, yeah. you know, in the spaces, you know, where, where I expect them to be. So I guess my question is, and I don't know if you can answer it, but, but who, who is stopping this from happening? It's, it's, multi, it's multi-layered, Fola, isn't it? Like it's, it's not like it's one person in one position. That if you're not getting um, through the door to interview as a teacher, that could be the administrator in a teaching school, or it could be the course leader. If you're not getting um, passed in your NQT year, I've heard a horror story recently, because quite a lot of schools go out to Jamaica or go out to like, countries and go and do a mass recruitment campaign and bring like 20 teachers over and promise them the world and sit them in a flat in South London, but don't really look after them and nurture them pastorally. For a year, they teach science and math, but then at the end of the year, they, they're not given a contract or they're not given their, mm. their full qualification status. So there, there is, that, 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 that's just a really, really poor practice yeah. about people management. Um, so then, if then it's about the line management, because quite often, yeah. like schools don't do unconscious bias training. Like it's becoming a thing, but in other sectors and in, in corporate spaces, you have to go through that training. You can't mm -hmm. sit on a recruitment panel if you haven't had unconscious bias training. So okay. we've got, if we think top down, we've got governors who are recruiting head teachers without that training. And you might have an all white straight male um, sort of like panel who then yeah. recruit a head teacher in the image of themselves. Then you've got the SLTs in schools, which are also non-diverse, who are talent spotting staff within their schools. Mm. You've got these layers upon layers of non-diverse groups of people where if there's a lack of diversity and there's a lack of unconscious bias training, it's yeah. a double whammy. And then that filters down to the other systems of leadership and schools are so hierarchical, particularly secondary schools, which is my background. You have so many tiers and, and I, we talk a lot um, in Women Ed about glass ceilings. Mm, yeah. I'm, I'm acutely aware of the concrete ceiling, that this kind of <laughs> this systemic barrier, this structural mm. um, mechanism that keeps people down. Um, and, and it's very, very hard to infiltrate. And, and there's been quite an injection of funding. So in the last yeah. um, three to four years, the Department for Education has put out all this money to the system called the Equality and Diversity Grant. And you can bid for a big pot of money and you can then run a program. So when I worked in South London, I ran three of these programs. We mm -hmm. had a program for aspiring women leaders and we had two programs for aspiring BAME black brown um, leaders. And we had the biggest cohort. We had 90 people. And I can remember, and this is just a, just, this is a visual that I think is really important to share. I was in Crystal Palace in a school that was like 70% black. And mm. I had 90 people of colour in one room and we were doing the opening to this programme and the black kids in that school, it completely stirred them up because mm. they had never seen so many yeah. black adults in their school before. Yeah. And they were going around the school telling each other, we had this sea of children peering through the windows yeah. in this big sort of training room. And I can remember going out, the head teacher went out to say, is everything okay? And the kids were saying, like, where have all these black adults come from? Like, why don't we have teachers like this in our school? And it was, and that just, that just spoke so symbolically and so loudly yeah. that we've got children who look up in their school That's organizational right. structures and they do not see themselves. Yeah. And ultimately, what messages are we sending it explicitly and implicitly yeah. to yeah. our young people if we've got white men running our schools and black women cleaning our schools and there's yeah. not people of colour in the, in the positions of power. So going yeah. back to your question about like, what is it, who is it, why is it? For me, it's down to patriarchal power. It's to do with privilege. It's to do with the fact that, that there's a rhetoric around we need to diversify, but are people prepared to relinquish the power? Yeah. Are they prepared yeah. to lean out? Are they prepared to, to make a seat at the table for other people to step in? And are they then prepared to be challenged when you then get different ways of thinking? Because we have a real group think kind of situation in yeah. some organisations where it serves them to have lots of people who look the same, think the same, right. do the same, because no one challenges them. Yeah, that's right. And, and so we're in a totally different period now. I, I, I want 
to believe. You know, we're, we're in a period where everybody, including me, who, you know, has sort of done good things within a system, you know, he's saying it's not enough. You know, it, it, it's not enough. You know, this, this is not good enough. Whatever we thought was okay actually is not okay. And we really need to, to have sustainable change for the right reason. Now, listening to you, do you sense that that is also what is being felt, you know, across in, the, in, in these places, you know, where, where people are sad? Do, do, you, do you sense that same discomfort, you know, for change, you know, or, do you, or, or if you were speaking to me, for example, and I want to do something about it, what would you be saying to someone like me or, or someone listening that we do to create that discomfort because it is just not good enough? Yeah, I, I think for me, we've gone from like zero to 100. We've gone from an ignorance and a denial that we need to do something to because it's all happened, because of George Floyd's murder, because of Black Lives Matter has been so sort of high profile and public and it's on every social media platform. You cannot ignore it. You cannot avoid yeah. it. And because everyone's trapped at home on social media, I feel like there's been a real wake up call for a lot of people who for a long time have been pretending this isn't happening. Mm. Um, so I feel like there's no avoiding it and there's no getting away with it. And I think that's, that's that I'm hopeful and optimistic about that because I think the public scrutiny is, is going to garner that kind of that agency and that energy. However, one of my fears is people are now like going from crawling to running very quickly. Mm -hmm. And actually, where's yeah. the strategy? Where's the yeah. like for sustainable transformation over time yeah. that is going to last and be systemically and structurally impactful? It needs to be strategic. And I think yeah. that's what's kind of lacking, that if we look at politics, if we look at the government, if we look at the Department for Education, are there people there who get it? And mm. the fact that this week we've had the we've had the BBC broadcast at the start of the week. We've had a follow up where um, two people I know, Yolanda and Aretha, who have set up um, Mindful Equity, which is a, a support right. network for, for, for black teachers. They've been on the news and there's campaigning and act activism around the diversification of the curriculum. But you've got Nick Gibb, the school's minister, putting in print that we do not need to change the curriculum. Yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah, we do. And like you, yes, you're an absolute do. fool to think that, say that, and put that out there. So I think there's there's something about the thought leadership, the thought leadership with it, which needs addressing, because the barriers in government, in politics, are predominantly white men, not elite yeah. men. So for me, it's where can we get that alignment? I guess from the grassroots spaces okay. to the system. So a lot of my contacts run these grassroots communities. They're really powerful. They're amplifying, they're challenging, they're disrupting. But how do you get that into the system to be that sustainable change in the system? So one thing I've been involved in is that on Tuesday morning, we hosted a diversity and education um, roundtable event. And we had 45 mm. people there. And we had 45 people who all hold a seat of power in the education system they're big stakeholders Excellent. they run all the governing organizations they run like the biggest training organizations and we had and lots of the researchers in universities and we had mm. a joint conversation and the reason why we called that meeting and i was one of the people who organized it and hosted it um was the fact that like nothing's coming down to us nothing's coming out so are we going to accept this or are we going to push out what we want to see so like the language we're talking through are we yeah. need coherence, we need cohesion, we need strategy, we need a call to action. So we are doing planning as a group to get that collective agency mm. to then do something with it. And it will probably be an open letter to the DfE. Um, it will probably be a series of campaigns around like this needs to be done, but it also needs to be done by the people who get it and the people yeah. who've done it and the people who can show impact in it yeah. and not what happens quite often is suddenly they decide that we need to do this and the money goes out into the system and the wrong people then bid for the money mm -hmm. because it's money and there's power attached mm -hmm. to it and exposure and you end up with the wrong people then guiding the strategy yeah yeah no and i and i think that is both good to hear in terms of what you're doing you know and 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 the sort of advocacy 
you know, around this, because I do agree it needs to be strategic. I do agree it needs to be managed and monitored. And I do agree it has to hold people to account. You know, it has to hold from, from government all the way down to account to really see the change. And this is where the leadership, you know, comes into this whole thing, having strong leadership that uh-huh. drives change, uh-huh. you know, and, and my hope is that, you know, we create, I mean, even if it's starting at the grassroots, that we create so much discomfort within the system that leadership cannot ignore the voice that is coming through it just becomes impossible yeah, to ignore absolutely and if i can speak to that because i think the whole thing around leadership and accountability and change leadership in particular so if we think about what's happened in the last few years around mental health and well-being okay we know we've got an absolute national crisis when it comes to mental health and well-being and what's happened is a white paper has been written and mm. there's legislation and statutory compliance that have been put out there that every organization is supposed to have someone trained in mental health and well-being for example Programs have been written, frameworks have been written, where every school could and should nominate a mental health and wellbeing champion. So mm. that is systemic and it is strategic. Yeah. And if you think about how schools sort of operate, you'd then have your school action plan, your school improvement plan, your school self evaluation plan, where you would have KPIs and milestones about mental health and wellbeing. We need the same about yeah. diversity and inclusion. We need to be strategic, it needs to be tactical, it needs to be specific. It needs to be held to account. It needs to be evaluated. And I, I, I think because it's a protected characteristic and it's about people, mm-hmm. and it's about prejudice, people don't apply the same way of thinking. But strategic leadership is about what's the problem, what's the solution, and, and what are we going to do to get there? Exactly. And I think like, what I'd love to see is like, more auditing about what's going wrong, more kind of like intentional, purposeful activity, and then breaking it down and creating that strategic plan for What are we going to do this term, this year, in two years' time, in three years' time? What's the goal in five years' time? Um, And I think when you... Because I I do think a lot of people are overwhelmed. I think Mm. it's a massively complex topic. There's so many different layers and tiers and aspects to it. But to map it out and to break it down and to chunk it and to do that sustainable um, sort of leadership approach, that to me is what's lacking. And one of the things I'm doing with a friend of mine, so um, Angie Brown was a, a black female head teacher in Bristol, and it's, they've been in the press quite a lot for not being very diverse in their head, headship. Um, we've done a lot of work together over the years. So we have written a programme to train a leader in every school on how to lead diversity, equity and inclusion. Because we've done that work as school leaders and as head teachers. And I think the power in our unity is she's a black woman who's navigated the system. Yeah. I'm a white woman who's been an advocate and an ally mm. of, of, my, of my, my black brothers and sisters who have navigated the system. And between the two of us, we're just like pooling our knowledge and experience to walk this walk with people and to create that support network where there's yeah. training opportunities, but also like that, the discomfort in the conversations, like we need to speak to that. We need to lean into the met- messiness and we need to get under the skin of the problem and stop yeah. pussyfooting around. And have yeah. like really, really deep, candid conversations. And I think that's a good thing. And and I think for anybody listening, whether they're a teacher or head teacher, I think one of the things I want to do is point them to some of what you're talking about. Because I was speaking to a head teacher in a in a primary school in Harrow yesterday, and and I know the struggle she has had, first of all, to get to where she is, but even where she is now in terms of the challenges. Does that make sense? And I think the more head teachers and teachers get together around some of what you're talking about because they know the systems they 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 know it more than anybody else you know i think the the better and the more holistic those solutions will be so that that's really really good and and one of the things i i wanted to to refer to just coming back to, to the conversation on on sunday was the thing about the male black teacher now we obviously had one of our young panelists who who is a young, you know, um, aspiring black male teacher. And I, and I just got some information for him. And this is what he sent to me when I said I was going to be speaking to you this morning. He said, my position as a black male teacher makes it feel as though there is a weight or a responsibility on me to be a role model and mentor, not just to all students, but specifically to black students. 
in which their, their qualms are brought up with me rather than their respective mentors. In terms of middle senior leadership, there needs to be a higher intentionality around the recruiting of black males, especially in metropolitan cities and not just for pastoral roles. So there seems to be an issue around black male teachers. Can you help us to just understand that a little bit more from your perspective? So, so if we look at the data around diversity in the system, we, we lump together anyone who's not white. That's the first problem. So like, like the data around black versus Asian versus minority teachers needs yeah. looking at. And then within the, the race demographic data, we need to look at gender as well. So doing other things also to throw into the mix here around black men in particular is that like if we think about um, coaching and mentoring, for example. So there, a lot of school leaders have coaches and a lot of coaches are white women. And when you look at diversity, within coaching circles there there is some diversity but you might have black women doing the coaching not black men so one of my questions would be if we had more black male coaches nurturing leadership of black men would we get more black men leaders in the system because mm. for me that's a pipeline that we yeah. need to have a look at um i think that pigeonholing happens perhaps more to black men than it does, does to black women from anecdotes of what I've heard from people. So when I ran those diversity programs, they were predominantly female. Um, and the, the black men were being pigeonholed around behavior. Whereas mm -hmm. I've seen black women perhaps circumnavigate some of those stereotypes and end up in different roles. I've, like I've, I've seen sort of black, black women being head of maths, being assistant head teacher, leading teaching and learning. Like there's, yeah. there's I, I, so I've seen more black women perhaps um, get elevated and talent spotted. And, I'm, and I'm, I haven't necessarily thought or considered why that is. Is it because you've got a disproportionate number of black women in the system compared to black men, perhaps? Mm. So the talent pool is slightly bigger. Is it that you've then got, it, it then becomes a self fulfilling prophecy. Have you got less um, sort of like visible role models of, of black men up the ladder so that yeah. it's hard to navigate? Um, and then when black men do leave um, education, like the school system, the formal system, they tend to go into like, from my experience, like mentoring type roles where they're working with children and they're working with the marginalized and they're doing the kind of mm. the social work, kind of the, the motivation side of stuff. Mm. Um, whereas black women tend to become coaches for other black teachers in the system. So I feel like there is, there's something to disrupt there about the different pathways um, and yeah. the different kind of like stereotyping. And I think, I can't remember if I said it on your call or not. I've done so many calls recently. So, I learned about a different type of bias I wasn't aware of. I went to this event in Canada a couple of years ago. It was like an international um, educational leadership conference. And I was talking about um, diversifying um, the, the teaching body. And mm. we were talking about um, diversity and inclusion. And a group of um, Canadian Asian heritage teachers said to me, in Canada, it's not about your skin colour, it's about your accent. And if you uh -huh. sound Canadian, if you sound Canadian, you get promoted. If you don't sound Canadian, you don't. And they called it auditory bias. And I, and I had this kind of epiphany and I came back and I went back to my school and I really thought about who I'd worked with over the years. And I've seen that at play. Okay, so as an English teacher, so I've, I was like head of English, head of performing arts and special arts. Um, I've worked with a lot of black women who ended up teaching drama, teaching media studies, teaching the softer subjects. Mm. So if they were black British, they would teach English. But if they were black Caribbean or black African, they'd teach media or drama. And there becomes this kind of like almost hierarchy within schools of who is teaching which part of the curriculum. In a science department, in the schools I've worked at, or maths, you end up with quite a lot of overseas recruited teachers. Mm. Quite often in science, in the schools I worked at, you have a lot of black African men who mm. might have an accent and then are they being sidelined to teach key stage three yeah. rather than a level so i think there's some systemic things at play there that mm. people don't necessarily see it as systemic racism but it is yeah yeah well that, that that's really very enlightening hannah and and as we as we sort of come to the end i'm just going to read a few things to you and then i'm going to ask you a, a sort of final question that pulls everything together because on the day you said you can't be it if you can't see it you know and that was one of the phrases you say you hear a lot that you like i think you also said on on sunday which i think you sort of 
it talks about today that one thing we can do to effect change is to focus the training on the system, not on the individuals being caught in the system. Train the pale male still leaders to be inclusive, not train diverse people to be empowered. The barriers, obstacles need addressing and removing. The system needs changing first. And I think that's a bit of what you sort of reiterated as well today. And, and, and one of the, my final statements that I sort of got from, from the BBC News when it was talking about students, and he said, for all students, representation and visibility in multicultural Britain is crucial. Those who teach us and what we are taught has the power to transform lives. And I thought that was just such a powerful statement because you were talking not just about what we are taught, but also who is teaching us, you know, and that sort of summarized it so well. So I think the issues are out there now. I mean, there's still layers, like you said, to just sort of um, navigate and, and get deeper to understand this some more. But for where we're at now, if you were going to say some final words to, to people who want to engage, people, students, you know, parents, you know, um, educators, what would, you, what would you be saying to them if you had the opportunity, you know, with all the change we want to see, with, with, with all the work that is going on, what would be your final words to them um, to sort of help them feel they can be a part of the change, but also to be encouraged by what is happening? So, wow, that, that's a big question. And I think I'll break it down into perhaps the different stakeholder groups, because if we think about visibility and representation, which are the two things we're talking about here, like how, how can we make role models visible but how can we also get people up the ladder to become those visible role models? Yeah. And then the representation, not only visually in the people in the system, but also in the curriculum. So that, that, that's the kind of the two things I'm thinking about. So if you think about the students, first of all, I, like, I think we're in a real time of student activism. And I do, I'm doing some work with some different charities. So that, like, if you're a young person on the call, check out UK Youth. They run mm -hmm. lots of different advocacy and activism groups check out Phoenix, Phoenix Education. They run um, an event every year. I'm part of it in um, August. It's called Freedom to Learn. And they are organizations who are empowering young people. Because I do think that there's, there's an agency and there's a power around young people leading this work. So I've, I've got friends with kids who are in secondary schools and they are doing student-led activity to mm. raise the profile. And they are finding their voice and they are challenging the system as young people and that, that is so powerful so, so that's part one part two when it comes to the teachers I think it's like if you are the only one because I know a lot I know a lot of anecdotes about black and Asian teachers who are the only one in their school then mm -hmm. please network there are amazing networks out there please check out the BAME Ed network um, mm -hmm. website please check out Mindful Equity please check out Aspiring Head Teachers which is a program for black heads I think it's about being on Twitter, being on LinkedIn, and, and a phrase that we use is like finding your tribe, that you might be the only one in your context, but you can find the other only ones, and mm. you then create that peer support network. Then, when you're thinking about your ambitions as a teacher going into leadership, please find a mentor or a coach. Um, and again, like harnessing your network, and if you're struggling, contact me. I know loads of people who are mentors and coaches, they might not all be people of colour, but like I've coached a lot of people as well. I've got lots mm. of friends who can help you walk that walk and, and help open those doors. And I think it's that like you're not alone. And I think it's really yeah. important to remember there's a lot of support out there. You just can't always see it or it might not, not be in your immediate vicinity. If you are a, a senior leader or a middle leader on the call and, and you identify as being like straight, white, able bodied, then we need to be allies and we need to be advocates. And like it's like just being passive is not good enough. And it's about mm. what can we do to speak up and stand up and lean in um, and not talk on behalf of people, but to be part of the solution. And I think that's really important. We've had too many people for too long sat on their laurels and we need to actually do this work together. And then I think for the parents and the carers, it's also about having voice that being dependent on your own experience within education. Um, I, I sometimes feel like I have particular groups of parents who pull back. So if I give you an example, as a, as a head teacher, I was the head teacher of a secondary school, but I then got asked to open a primary school. And because we were doing so much work around diversity and inclusion, 
we ended up attracting the most diverse families from the local community. So I had like 24% kids who were Bain. It was amazing. We had this beautifully diverse school. But I, I've got this striking image of my black mums gathering together off site. They, mm. they, they would stand and talk in the street. They're like, come into the playground, come and talk to me. And I think it's about that kind of like making sure that you are collectively like mm. having those conversations with the school. I don't think schools are very good at tapping into their parent and carer bodies. And actually, I mean, there's a wealth of experience and expertise and wisdom and, and talent in the parent bodies. So like go and be the parent governor, go and be a mm. governor in, in a school. That's, that's a message I can give to everyone on the call, okay? If we're going to change the system, we need to diversify governing bodies. If we had more diverse people on governing bodies, we would have more diversity in leadership teams. Mm. If we had more diversity in leadership teams, we'd have more diverse mm -hmm. teachers and mill leaders. Mm. And if we had more diverse people doing the selection and training of teachers, we'd have more diverse teachers. So lean into those spaces and go and be disruptive and go and help dismantle these systems. I think that is incredible. I think everybody's got a something to take away from that. So thank you so much, Anna. You know, it's been a pleasure talking to you, you know, your energy, your passion, you know, and, and, and you, you, you're actually doing it, you know, you're not just talking it, you're actually doing it, you know, so, so that is really encouraging. So I just want to say thank you to you. I'm sure we'll talk some more. Definitely. You know, I'm sure it's been incredibly helpful thank you, for thank everybody. You, thank you for having me. It was an absolute privilege to be in that space. And I, I took so much away from all of the speakers and I also found them all on LinkedIn and Twitter so we're now all connected <laughs> and Thanks, please, please. please please join up the dots and connect because you never know how one of those people you listen to or who you connect with might be able to open a door support you in the future yes thank you so much so look forward to speaking to you again soon um bless you Hannah thanks a lot Cheers, Fola. thank you okay thanks bye-bye